This is the Empower Podcast. Released June 25th, 2017. Episode 349. Another interview with John Oxer. Welcome to the Amp Hour. I'm Chris Gamble of Contextual Electronics. And I'm Jonathan Oxer from Superhouse and Freetronics. And just because we don't have Dave here, I've got to say it. What's up, nerd? <laughs> uh, not not much. Not much. Uh, uh, classic Aussie uh, sound. I, I, just, I guess we have a replacement Aussie this week, huh? <laughs> yeah, I can be the token Aussie. You need one. There. Yeah, well, let's hear, let's hear your best Aussieism. My best Aussieism. Uh, I'm actually not very Aussie at all. <laughs> in fact, um, my secret is that I was born in London. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. No, no. Uh, I I was born to Australian parents who were uh-huh. living in England at the time, and I came back to Australia when I was really little, like not even one year old. But wow. did you get dual citizenship or no? I think I qualify for it, but um, I haven't gone through the process of applying for a British passport. Yeah. Well, in these days, too, with Brexit, who cares? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, it doesn't give us the benefits it used to. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, welcome back, man. How you been? Yeah, thanks. I'm oh, really good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we were just That's saying good. before the show that it was 2012 when I was last on, and it doesn't yeah. seem that long at all. I'm looking at the picture, too, and uh, you had hair in this picture, and you oh, don't yeah. have hair anymore. Yeah, not, so. not anymore. I'm more streamlined now. <laughs> Yes, that's right. You're aerodynamic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, um, there's actually one of, a strange reason why I did that, among others. One of them is that when I've been filming videos for Superhouse, I've been recording them in little snippets. And the funny thing was that I did a video where I started the recording, I think it was back in like 2010. And then I finished uh-huh. that episode in like 2016 and edited <laughs> it together. And partway through the video, I make it go blank and I just have a thing on the screen that says six years later or whatever. (laughs) So you can't rush some projects, but I looked so radically different between those two. And I figured, hey, if I just keep my hair clipped all the time, then I'll look the same. And no one will know if it takes me six years to finish a project. (laughs) Yeah, man. The only thing that'll be different is if you like you have a tan from the summer or whatever. right? Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Right. Mm. Well, uh, yeah, that, that, that's a good plan. That's a good plan. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you're filling in for Dave today. Uh, yeah. thanks for doing that. Uh, Dave's a slack ass like yeah. usual. Oh, of course. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, uh, you have some news, huh? Yeah, I do. Um, so let's hear about it. S- sure. So I, um, as listeners may know, <clears throat> I've had, um, several businesses. There is Freetronics, of course, and Superhouse. But I've also had a software company, and just recently we sold the company, actually, to our biggest competitor. And just because of the way the sale worked out and the circumstances around it that I won't go into in detail here, the end result is that my net position is negative. So we ended up with a very big tax bill, so like seven-figure tax bill to pay, that sort of thing, which is quite scary. So... Um, even though I've just sold a company and, you know, technically you can say, oh, I've sold a company for millions of dollars. Um, it's not like I'm sleeping on a pile of cash. So I've had to start looking around at, um, at other work. And, um, just recently, I think it was only about four nights ago, I was sitting on the couch with my laptop and I thought, I'm going to see what jobs are around for engineers. And I went to one of the local job seeker sites and I just started looking down you know, entry level positions and things. And uh, there were all, of, they have all these requirements, like they'll say five years of Python experience or whatever. And they're all quite focused on a particular area. So they have a specific need. They want someone that is going to fulfill that specific need. And that's totally understandable. But my particular circumstance is that I didn't actually finish university. And my experience since that time has been very broad. I've worked in um, in hardware and in software and associated things as well. So as I was looking down this list, I found that even for entry-level positions, I couldn't tick any of the boxes. Like I couldn't say, yeah, I am a great Python developer or 
I can do, you know, um, kernel development or whatever. So I got frustrated and I thought, um, like, I don't qualify for any of these positions and I've been doing this sort of work for so long. What's going on? And I ended up writing a Facebook post that was a little bit tongue in cheek. Basically what I did was I listed a whole bunch of different things that I've done over the years. So I said, um, you know, I've worked on satellites and I've written five books and I've designed boards that have been used by hundreds of thousands of people and you know, all of these things. And yet when I go and look at entry level positions, I don't qualify for any of them. Right. And yep. it was basically just a, you know, it was a it's throwaway like venting, right? It was I me mean, venting. Yeah, it wasn't meant yeah, to be anything yeah. really big and deep, but it seems to have struck a chord. And yep. um, I've had a few different types of reactions to it. There are many, yes, many I comments also, on that I also post read now. the uh, the Y Combinator uh, responses. And the, <laughs> yep. Those yep. were less friendly than the friends on Facebook. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I know the reality is that once you are in the industry for a while, you're not a recent graduate. People aren't going to be looking at you and saying, um, you know, what was your score in this particular class? You know, that sort of thing isn't relevant anymore. It's much more about the sorts of jobs you've done, the experience you have, and I'm well aware of that. So yeah, those, right, right. Um, those check boxes on job ads are really a, a bit of a filter that are used by recruiters to try to match up people to positions, and they don't necessarily understand the roles themselves. They're acting as a conduit. Uh, right, right. When I, I would say the other thing, too, that's interesting about all this is like, uh, you know, they, they, they do this, like you said, it's a it's a filter mechanism and that kind of thing. But really what people want is like, it's, it's kind of indicative of the job industry or the job, the job market rather too, that they want, they want something that could solve a problem right now. And that's fine. Like that's what they're looking for. But oftentimes like that inflexibility means that they just keep the thing open forever. Whereas someone who could actually go in and figure it out, you know, like without all the experience, then they, they don't necessarily, they, they miss out on a lot of people. Yeah. So they're, they're missing out on opportunities for people that could solve the problem, but not necessarily in an optimal way. Right. Uh, yeah. So I've had a few people um, uh, give me some snarky responses uh, saying, well, you you totally don't understand the whole job hunting process and, and that sort of thing. <laughs> That's probably true though, right? <laughs> and it probably is because the reality <laughs> is that I haven't worked for anyone else for something like 25 years. I haven't right. had to go and do interviews and people right. have said, Oh, so send me your resume. It's like, I don't have a resume. Like, I, I haven't, my resume is all online. Yeah. It's the projects that I've done. Right. This is, this is kind of terrifying to me. And I'm sure that a lot of people in the audience can, can relate to this too, where it's just like, this is, a lot of people are like this now, you know? It's not like, it's not like, uh, a lot of people don't have this, this defined path that like these jobs look for. And so I, th I think the only difference is that normally you would just go and start another thing, right? I mean, yeah, that's, that's really right. the only difference. Yeah, and so. uh, and in fact, I do have other things like I've got Freetronics, which is still going on, yeah. and Superhouse. But the reality right. is that those have done, those don't have big margins in them. They're things I'm really doing for fun. Like Freetronics doesn't pay me a wage, so I can't just sit back and live on that. And right. I need some other way to bring in income. And um, yeah. so, yeah, it is an interesting position to be in. It's. Uh, it's kind of daunting and I've definitely gone through the whole imposter syndrome uh, process as well and yeah. I think that's partly because I've been uh, I mean anyone who works in engineering ha probably has this to some degree oh yeah I mean, there, are, <laughs> <laughs> there are probably people out there that have um, an overblown sense of their own abilities and big egos and things like that but I think for most of us we look at our own work and measure it against what we see other people doing and think, no, I can't stack up to that. And so... Well, usually, usually we, we also compare it to the, the finished product, which is what we see on the internet. Right? Yeah, that's, that's right. That's, that's the worst thing. You don't exactly. see the process, you see, you see the end result. Yes, that's right. And, um, yeah, and so we judge ourselves against the cream of the crop, like the, the very best polished result, the one that actually made it out, not all of the failures along the way. So, um, and because I've been... I haven't been working in industry like for other companies over that time. I haven't seen a lot of that process. So, yeah, um, I've had a whole lot of people come back to me and say, you don't know your own value. And, um, and that's probably true. And so 
I've got to overcome some of my own internal resistance as well. And this is also just partly my nature because I'm uh, kind of a shy person. And oh I, yeah, super shy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I, I don't know why, but I've always been down on myself in general. So I will do something, right, right. and other people will say, "Hey, that's really cool," and I'll go, "Oh well, it took me like twenty-seven tries to get there." So I focus on the twenty-seven failures and not the one that got there at the end. Uh, but right, right. Yeah, I think it is a, a thing that a lot of people have to overcome. It's yeah, it's about valuing it's ourselves. It's an interesting conversation in 2017 too of just like, well, so like a lot of a lot of things you're looking at are like these kind of uh, these specific job listings, right? And what what your what your post basically says is like you're you're the, you know, the every not the every man, but like the you can do a lot of different things, mm. and that is necessary for a lot of posts, but a lot of people won't list that kind of thing, right? Yeah, uh, and. One of the things that we're often told when applying for jobs, like the general advice is, if you look at a job that you're going for, then tailor your, tailor your application to highlight the particular attributes they're yeah, looking for. Right, right. And that's yeah. the exact opposite of, uh, of what I did in this Facebook post, which is just lay out, oh, I've done all of these wildly different things, mm -hmm. and therefore I can address myself to a whole lot of different areas. So... Uh, I think if you're applying for a specific job, then yes, you definitely need to tailor right. your approach to it. But in right, my particular then, like, case, like like you're yeah. saying here too, it's like you've you know you design boards. So if you're applying for an EE position, right, it's like you could talk about that one thing, but then it's like that's you know what five percent of your time, ten percent of your time, whatever you were doing it for. Yes. And yes. so even just in a time a time perspective, it's it's crazy. But, that's right, and it also means you, that I yeah. if um, if I'm applying for a job designing boards. And I was going up against someone like Dave Jones, who has spent years with that as his sole <laughs> job. Dave does not uh, design boards anymore. Oh, not, let's any, be not anymore, but, but he did. <laughs> like when he was in previous jobs, right, that right, was yes. his yes, sole job was laying out boards. And right, someone yes, who has it, done that job solely full time for a couple of years, they're going to whip my ass, basically. Of course. So, uh, but I can probably do other things that they can't do. So. Yeah. yeah, it's this whole tension. That's another thing that's interesting to me is that like, so like I think about like an electrical engineer, especially because you say you're looking at entry level, which is kind of silly, I think. But but like, so thinking about electrical engineering, so you spend 5% of your time building boards, let's say, like that that represents the amount of time that you've spent on, on Freetronics and everything else. Like that's pretty close to how much time an EE will spend building boards most of the time too, right? Because it's like most jobs are mostly meetings and emails and you know talking <laughs> yes. to distributors and and relationship management all that stuff yes but again that doesn't that doesn't ever get highlighted it's not like show me a portfolio of your emails please when you come in for an ee interview you <laughs> yes. know like and, yet, right. and yet that stuff is so important like the of knowing that you're supposed to go and and design or sorry go go and talk to a vendor you know six months before you're actually putting a thing out into the world right they never asked that in an interview, but yet that's that's a, a that's a skill, critical piece of knowledge. Yes, exactly. That's something you learn over time. That it's like that that can literally save the company millions of dollars. Yeah, you yeah, know? that's right. So, yeah, and know. these are the sorts of lessons that you learn the hard way once you actually get experience and work on real projects. Right. So it's almost like an indictment of uh, of job listings more than anything, right? Um, yeah, but I don't really know how to fix that problem. <laughs> it was. And you're right, I probably shouldn't be looking at entry-level jobs, but it just came about from this evening, that particular evening, sitting on the couch watching TV, pulled out the laptop and thought, oh, what jobs are there? And <laughs> yep, exactly. this was just my reaction to that. <clears throat> um, right, but right. the reality is that I know a lot of people, and I suppose one of the interesting things to come out of this is uh, that can be useful for other people to know is that... Um, you and Dave have talked in the past about showing real products or projects that you've worked mm -hmm. on yeah, and right. doing things like maintaining an online portfolio. So if you work on a project, if you can, depending on your employment arrangements, then talk about it online, make it public. And the mm -hmm. thing is that because I've worked largely on open source for all of this time and I kind of like to show people what I do, if you start looking around at the things that I've put online, there is quite a big body of work there. Now, it's not necessarily any bigger than anyone else. It's just that it's visible because I've been talking about it. And yeah, so exactly. getting into that habit of posting about projects that you're doing along the way 
it's not necessarily going to give you any immediate benefit right now, but five years down the track when you're looking for a job, you can go to a prospective employer and say, look at this track record I've got. I've worked on all of these different things. Right. And they right, can it's see it. It's not just a LinkedIn page with like years you've worked at a place. Exactly. Right? It's actual yes. real things. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, and that and it sense. also means that you end up known by many more people. They start to recognize your name. And right. Um, that's one of the other <laughs> strange, one of yep. the strange comments I saw, I think it was on Hacker News, um, yeah. was someone commenting about, oh, I've seen his work and, and I know his name. That's all the qualifications I need or something like that. Right. And it was just because, <clears throat> because I've been visible. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because I've been visible about the projects I've worked on. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Yeah, I, I wasn't actually worried when I saw your post. Mm. I, don't, I, don't, I don't think many people who know you were, so... No. <laughs> yeah. Don't give this man a job, guys. I mean, like... So, yeah, he's going to be fine. He's going to yeah, be fine. Yeah, yeah. I'll be fine. And yeah. the reality is I know I'll be fine. It's... Um, yeah. And the, actually, one of the other interesting aspects to come out of this is the issue of relocation. So this is probably a big topic oh, for a lot of people as well. Yeah. My initial Are you guys thinking reaction, about that? Uh, no, and that is a problem as far as job prospects are concerned. So, well, you are in the uh, backwaters of the world. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> I'm right at the bottom. Yes, I'm in Melbourne, Australia. Right, so I'm you not can just... go a little further south, but you have yeah. pretty much one place you can work. That's right. I can go to Tasmania, <laughs> which is oh, a beautiful actually, I meant, place. I meant, I meant the Antarctica. Oh, uh, the Antarctica. Science yeah, station. the research yeah. base. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, yeah, I've known people who have done that. <laughs> it does sound interesting. Yep. yep. Uh, so my initial reaction to these job postings was the issue of, uh, of meeting those check boxes. Like, can you say you've got five years of Python experience and, um, and that's one aspect to it. But the other aspect to it is a lot of engineering jobs require you to be located in a certain place. Yeah. Now, over the years, <laughs> and not only is the nicest place either. No, that's right. <laughs> yeah. And so, over the years, I've spoken to many companies about possibly working for them, and they're all you know the big names that everybody would recognise. But they've all required relocation. For example, um, if you go and work for Google, then you're probably going to end up in California or maybe Dublin. Um, they do have a Sydney office here have, as well. They have a Chicago office have, too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but if you start looking at these big companies, they have almost no presence in Melbourne. So Melbourne is basically a desert as far as um, tech companies go. There are a couple of exceptions. There is a company yeah. like um, Blackmagic Design, which oh, is very... Oh, cool, the camera people. Yeah, right? exactly. So they are based right here in Melbourne, and they've got manufacturing facilities physically here in Melbourne, which is incredible. Pick and right, they can afford to manufacture there because they charge $5,000 for a camera. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So that's yeah. right at the top end. So there are a few exceptions like that. But almost universally, if you start talking to, say, Google or Facebook or someone like that, they will say, yeah, we can hire you and um, we'll relocate you to so-and-so. Now, yeah. for many people, that's fine, particularly if you're earlier in your career. That is a brilliant opportunity to go for. And it's also really good to travel. You get to see new things. In my particular circumstance, I have two kids that are in school. So they're in year seven and year 11. Oh, and yeah. it's that's, a, that's it's a, a critical one. stage of their education. So we really can't afford to take them out of school right now, move them around the world. Even So it doesn't matter how much they would offer to pay me. Um, it's just not going to happen. Yeah, it's just a lifestyle thing, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so what we've seen is for many software engineering positions, it is actually possible to work remotely. But for electronics, it's much harder. So, well, and that's another interesting point. It's just it's just hardware in general is hard to work remotely, right? Yes. As like, like unless you're a prototyper, kind of like out on your own doing your own thing. It's like even that. It's like, oh, I guess I'll ship you the prototype. Yes, like that's <laughs> that is there is just not. It's, it's not like there's like a, a a band of digital nomads who are EEs. As yeah. much as I I love the idea of it, and I I've talked about Portal Labs forever. Like it's yes. just. There's nothing like a lab. You know, you, you got to have a lab with you. That's or, right. Well, you got to have a lab somewhere. Yeah, you've got to have that. And um, so in my particular situation, because I am super lucky in terms of my home lab, uh, we did a renovation a couple of years ago, and I took the opportunity to build what is essentially a four-car garage, and the front half is for two cars, and the back half 
is my workshop. And it's I've, for nerds. It's yeah, <laughs> it is the ultimate nerd cave. So nice. I've got a fantastic setup here, and I've got um. So I've got all the basic tools, but I've also got things like a laser cutter, a 3D printer. I've got the little pick and place machine that I made. I've got a little photo studio here so I can take photos of products. Basically, I can fabricate anything I like just sitting right here in this room. But you really need to be physically located with someone for a lot of jobs. And um, and that is definitely a barrier. Yeah, well, what about like, um, I mean, consulting and stuff like that? I mean, I, I would think that would be... A pretty natural thing. I do know some people who do that. I mean, like, uh, well, our sworn enemies over at Embedded FM, they're <laughs> consultants, even though they are in the embedded realm. I think that there's yes. other hardware people that do that same kind of thing. So yes. what about that kind of thing, though? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, that would be a good possibility. Uh, so that may well be what I end up doing. Um, mm. Part of that as well is learning about the soft skills around consulting. And that's something oh, that I man. haven't done before. So I, I get to I get to mention my one of one of my uh, few favorite pages on the internet. Oh, please! Which is UnixWiz.be. I will always remember that. Yes. Uh, there's it's like how, no, of course that, that's actually wrong. It's like basically this guy's actually a um, he's a, a server based consultant, right? So he's obviously doing Unix based administration. Mm -hmm. um, but but basically he talks about like the. Uh, the warm fuzzy feeling. What's it? Oh man. Uni oh sorry. Uniquiz.net. So you want to be a consultant, and uh, yeah. So I'll put that in the show notes here. I guess I can send it over to you, even though it'll. <laughs> it's going to end. tell <laughs> our lovely mumble telling telling John that there was a link being sent there. Oh uh, <laughs> uh, yes. I wonder if there's yeah. a way I can mute that. It probably yeah. is. Ah, uh, it's fine. That's fine. Uh, yeah. So basically, though, it's uh, why work eight hours a day for someone else when you work six, any sixteen you want for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, so this is this side. is just a great this is a great um, document for anyone. I, I've recommended this before on the show. I think but mm -hmm. it's about you know how do you give that warm fuzzy feeling? How do you you know like billing hours, being consistent, like all that kind of stuff. And, yes. And and obviously, uh, you know. A big part of that is marketing yourself too, right? Obviously, you've talked about you've done a lot of that over the years of just showing that you can build things mm. and you can build things for other people. But then you also have to get the word out mm. that you're building things, right? Obviously, if you're on a podcast, maybe it would be a good a good way to do that. So yes, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you are known as the the place to go to get a job. Oh, is, oh, I didn't know that. All right. Yeah, well, well, send send the uh, send the thirty thousand dollar recruitment checks over to uh, Chris Gamble, not Dave Jones. No, no, uh, no. Yeah, in Chicago. Uh, yep. Uh, US dollars only. <laughs> that's right. Yes. None of that funny money. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> mm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, that that sounds like a great option, though. Uh, yeah. And it sounds like something that would be normal for someone in your situation where you've you've had the experience. It's, you know, like like past guests, too, right? So we were, we were talking about Jack Ansel before the show, but like Jerry and Sean and like people that are non-traditional educational routes where the that stuff was shut off to them. Mm but they still were doing interesting work, right? Mm -hmm. So Yes. Yeah. Um, and um, I do know a few people that have done, that have been consultants for many years. That's their primary mode of operation. And um, one of my friends who does that has said that he'd like to have a chat to me next week to talk about some of the, the process around it, how you go mm -hmm. about pitching for work and how you, yeah. you know, how you report your work back to them and that sort of thing. So, there are a whole lot of things that uh, I probably don't have the experience that I need, but I can pick those skills up along the way. I, I think can so. Wrap yeah, those I, around I, my I, technical skills. I have a couple of friends who do it too, and it's 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 really interesting hearing how it goes. Like I, I think that you know, like you talked about imposter syndrome and not valuing your work, but there's actually like a, a very specific version of that where people don't charge enough for their hourly right? oh yes and i've watched my friend do that and basically the only time that he ever raises his rates uh is when he just has too much work but that is that is that is the pressure valve right it's like well i got people asking for 80 hours of my time i've only got 40 billable you know like mm. that's probably still 60 hours of work yes um and it's like yeah you got to put the rates up you know and it, and it stinks because sometimes you want to help people that are doing interesting work you want to charge them less whatever but it's it's simultaneously like you need to value yourself and then you also need to stave off future work, right? By saying, well, this is my time and, mm. and he's, he's devised some interesting ways around it. Okay. And I think one of the other pressure valves is uh, fudging the hours and not charging for all the time you spend. 
And right, I think if you're that, learning something, you're saying. That's right. So I think that partly yeah. comes into the imposter syndrome as well because you might spend 20 hours working on something and think, Someone smarter might have done this in ten hours, so you bill ten hours instead. Right. And uh, well, you that's effectively not always the right value. call. Yeah, that's not always the right call, I don't think. But no, actually that's covered I, I don't in this think Unix it is the right call. Too. Yeah. That's right. So but it's yeah. a trap that I think I personally would fall into just because of you know what I know about myself. Right. So well one of the things this, this document talks about is like if you are gonna do that, if you are gonna give away if you're gonna give away hours for free because you were learning something, you still mention it, right? You say, I did this thing, I was learning, I'm not going to charge you for it, but you still mention it, right? Because yes. that is a value you provide and it's just being transparent, right? It's yes. like, so I, I think there's something there, but it's just, you know, you got to, yeah, you got to kind of feel out that situation. Mm -hmm. so. Yes. Yeah. Very good point. Um, yeah. So All right. We're of... witnessing the birth of a consultant here. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Um, man. So this, here's the real question though. Okay, you've been your own boss for 20 plus years, you said, right? Yes. How the hell would you work for someone else? That and and is, I know that consulting yeah. is working for someone else. And even when you have your own company, yes, you're working for someone else as a, you know, as a service provider, as a, as a products provider. But still, <laughs> mm. it, I don't know, man. Uh, it is a big psychological change. In fact, I've already seen that within the context of my software company because I am continuing um, just on a limited number of hours during the transition period under the new sure, owner. Yeah. Um, we had a situation come up just a few days ago where we needed some assistance with a particular database problem. And in the past, what we would have done is just uh, called someone that I know and said, can you come and uh, spend a few hours on this and bill us and get it done? But I actually don't have the authority to say that anymore. So right, I, right. I keep coming up against these situations where I think, oh, I'll just put that on the credit card or oh, hang on, no, I can't. <laughs> So I'm having to change my thinking totally about that. Uh, I think it would be very difficult for me to work uh, directly under someone and have them uh, tell me what to do and what I'm not allowed to do. Uh, right. And right. That's, that's a big change that I have to go through. Well, or not? Maybe you'll figure it out. I mean, I think. Well, I mean, there's certain there are certain roles like so. You know, I, I do product management now, and they and they. They, like, I've read a lot of stuff about it where it's like, oh, you're supposed to be like the CEO of a product, which is a bunch of BS, if you ask mm. me. But <laughs> yeah, that's right in the ego. In general, you are in. I mean, you're still you're still in charge of that thing, so that's good. Uh, but there's, you know, you're still going to have a reporting structure and yada yada yada. But you were kind of the top of the company, so that's the real difference, right? I mean, the buck stopped with you, so that's any any. Uh, any solace in that, that the buck might not stop with you? Oh, yes. Um, the, <laughs> it, this change is both good and bad. So in some ways, it's very freeing. Um, I can think, well, it's actually not my problem to solve that. And um, yeah. when you're at the top, ultimately, everything is your problem, even if you're not working on it personally. Right, it doesn't, right. Yeah. So that is a tricky one. Mm. Mm. Um, I, like I said, I'm not worried about you, man. You're going to be fine. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, it is, sure it is a very interesting situation, I think. And people will obviously be able to get in touch with you. We will give all your contact info at the end. So, yes. So what about what about the status of the other things, though? So you got you got Superhouse, you got Freetronics. What's what's going on with those? Yeah. Well, I haven't seen a Superhouse episode in a while, have I? No, it's been about five weeks since the last one came out. Okay. And that is, uh, it, they come out in bursts, which is unfortunate. And uh, when you're running a YouTube channel or obviously with a podcast, you want to be on a regular schedule. And I just regular ish. Regular ish, we'll say, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so people expect a certain cadence. And whenever I go a while without uploading a video, I start getting messages and backlash. And then I publish one again, and people say, Oh, welcome back to YouTube. And it, it's not that I've ever actually been away. I just took a while to get the last episode out. Um, yeah. And I would really like to be able to spend a bit more time working on that. Most of the time, because the projects that I feature on Superhouse, and um, just for the benefit of listeners that have no idea what we're talking about, um, yes, Superhouse is good. my YouTube channel where I do videos about home automation and hacking your house. So it's DIY home automation, lots of Arduino and Raspberry Pi and those sorts of things. And um, because I want to be able to show people how to do things, I don't want to just plug something in and say, oh, look, these are all the features. It takes quite a long time to produce each episode because I have to think mm -hmm. about the project and plan for it 
and um, quite often what I have to do is design a circuit board for that project and then send off for fabrication, etc. So in the most extreme case so far, as I said earlier, one of the episodes took about six years, but it's yeah. quite common for them to take two to three months. That's normal. And um, sometimes so, you got to inject stuff in your arm too. I mean, oh yeah, on, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah when you People go. can listen to episode, uh, what was it? 123, 120, 123. Yeah. Uh, 123. So, oh yeah. One, two, three. Uh, one, two, three. It's easy as one, two, three. And, yeah. and shoving a RF pill into your arm. That's right. <laughs> 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 um, so the result is that I end up with multiple um, projects all running in parallel at different stages of development. And yeah. then uh, sometimes it just happens that I finish off a few of them close together and then there'll be a long period where nothing is done. So it's very patchy. I have episodes yes. that come out yeah. in every now and then. Um, I'd like to commit to a regular schedule. Like Ideally, I'd like to be putting out an episode, say, every two weeks. But at the moment, yeah. that's just not practical. It hasn't been well, practical. You'll get there. Yeah. That's right. It hasn't been practical with my previous circumstances. Now that things are changing, everything is up in the air. Maybe I'll be able to get into that. Yeah, um, that's great. See another benefit right there. Yeah, and um, so, Freetronics. So what about free? Yeah. yeah, what about Freetronics? So Freetronics is still going along. It's been quite consistent for quite a long time. It's one of those businesses that um, that hasn't fallen in a hole, and it hasn't uh, become you know the new biggest tech thing. Most businesses tend to stay fairly flat and even and consistent, and that's what it's done. So unfortunately, there's not. It's not a big margin business because um, selling you know, Arduino related stuff. Electronics, yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I think um, we all know that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So even if you, especially from Australia, let's yeah, be honest. I mean, that's like, right. It's not, it is. Um, we have currency issues and we have shipping cost issues. Probably shipping cost is one of the biggest barriers that we have. Yeah, Everything. Right. It costs us a lot to get parts in. Costs us a lot to ship products out. So um, yeah, it, it's a nice business. It's still going on. It's consistent. Um, I ship orders every day. Like they'll, I'll go down to the post office and take a big pile of boxes and padded bags. Um, but it's not enough to um, provide me an income. So, yeah. what would be really nice would be to spend my time on Freetronics and Superhouse, and not have to worry about anything else. But it's just not there in terms of yeah, the, um, right, the right. income. Of course. Yeah. Mm. Well, that makes sense. I, I remember. Uh, I think you you had sent me. A board. I mean, I think you sent me one of the first boards that anyone ever was nice enough to send me. So I, I, I do appreciate really? that. Yeah. Yeah. I should and send you some more. No, I'm. I, 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 <laughs> believe me, since that first board, I, no, I've, I've collected. <laughs> yeah, I've collected a few, and I've made a bunch of my own too. But what I was going to ask about is that uh, I remember you sent a power over Ethernet board. Yes. And like, you don't really hear about that anymore. I mean, is that still? I mean, like, I know that like it's a thing, but it's not like. I don't know. Are, are a lot of your customers buying the the POE stuff? These Surprisingly, days, yes. And really? Yeah, and we get uh, customers that order them in reasonable numbers. With a lot of our products, because we sell to hobbyists, and um, so we have a different, a couple of different classes of customer. Uh, essentially, yeah, there are right, hobbyists. Right. There are professionals who are using them for prototyping purposes, and there's education. So in mm -hmm. education, they will typically buy things in like class sets. Hobbyists will buy one of something. Engineers will buy, you know, whatever they need for their project. Yeah, like three or something. Yeah, yeah whatever. Exactly. The, yeah. Um, but we also have uh, customers, particularly for the POE equipment, where they'll often buy 50 or 100 of a particular board because they're putting it into some small production run themselves. So they're designing oh, our board into their product. Okay. And So um, like system level design. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So one example is that there's a company that makes um, energy monitoring systems for solar panels and they designed our Ether 10 board into it, which is basically an Arduino with onboard Ethernet. Uh, they mm, yeah. designed that into their product. So they just plug the Ether 10 in using its headers and that becomes a network which, interface. Which, which we do not condone normally. We'll let it slide this time. But that's <laughs> from a sourcing perspective, that's actually pretty risky. But like... Yeah. But I mean, Freetronics quality is so great. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but so yeah, that can be risky case. from a supply chain perspective. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. And obviously, once they scale up, that sort of thing doesn't scale because it's just not economical to take a whole board, plug it in. Right, you, right. You, yep. You're better to design that functionality into your product. So once people get up into the thousands quantities, they go for a much more optimized solution. But we do find that for power over Ethernet in particular, 
a lot of people are buying either our PoE modules or the boards with PoE support on them, like the Ether Mega. So mm. um, that's probably one of our strongest sellers. I shouldn't say that because that'll give away our secret source to the competition. But um, if you look across our product range, we've got about 60 or 70 products. The Ethernet based boards are always the strongest sellers. Yeah. So even hey, in man. this age with, of Wi Fi and ESP8266. <laughs> So you can I, put, I tell you yeah. what, most days I kill for a LAN connect. Well, I asked you before the show. Obviously, we're we're both on LAN right now. Like, man, non-deterministic connections, they can, <laughs> you can keep them. You know? Oh yeah, like that's, they can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't. I'm not a fan of that. So no. Um, <laughs> well, talking about the um, the economics of scale and uh, and optimizing as you go up in quantity, yeah. it raises an interesting topic that I've been thinking about uh, recently. And I was just reminded of it yesterday. So, I mean, as you often talk about on the show, engineering is all about compromises. You've got to balance cost versus efficiency and size and power budgets and all of these sorts of things. But it's always really interesting to look at the extremes of situations. Well, I find it interesting anyway. So if you look at um, a scale of, say, number of something that you're going to produce, you can produce a very small number of it or a very large number of it. And a few years ago, I was uh, involved in a project that was really at the small scale, uh, which was the Argusat project. So I designed the payload processor module that flew on Argusat 1 and Argusat X. And when you're dealing with that sort of project, basically cost is meaningless. You really don't care. So we made a total of five boards. So this was like final production boards. Total production run was five. And two of them were for me for bench testing. Two of them were to go in the actual satellites. And one was in a functional satellite replica, which was set up at, um, at uh, the headquarters so that they could run tests on it before actually uploading code to the real satellites. So it gave them an exact replica of what was in the, the flying Right, like satellite. an Apollo 13 when they're switching on the switches, right? Yeah, that's right. So then... <laughs> just, to make, just to simulate what's going to happen on the real thing. That's right, yep. So when you're dealing with that sort of scale and the ramifications of failure are so high, I mean, if a part fails on that board and it's in orbit, then <laughs> that's the end of your mission. You really can't afford to scrimp on anything. And um, so in that particular sort of situation, if I, there's a part that'll do the job and it costs 10 cents and there's another part that will also do the job and it costs $10, but maybe it uses slightly less power or it's got some other attribute that makes it just slightly better. I'll go for the $10 part. Like I'm not even going to think about it. It's <laughs> really? uh, just give me the good stuff. I don't care if it's plated with unobtainium. So, um, and the thing is that that's an lead extreme situation. Like, what uh, about lead times? Well, with that sort of project, lead times usually aren't too much of an issue either. You really okay, want so to you're go only designing the... with stuff that are in stock at a distributor. Anyways. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So, and you okay. really want to make sure that your system is not going to fail after it's been um, accelerated up to twenty eight thousand kilometers an hour or something and thrown out above the atmosphere. <laughs> so details, details, details yeah. matter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but the thing is that. If you look at the other extreme, and this is what came up in this conversation with a friend of mine yesterday, he's an engineer who is working for a large US company, and um, <clears throat> they make a whole lot of different things, but they're essentially a toy company, so their scale is enormous. They make things, oh, yeah. Yeah. you know, quantities of a million, not quantities of five. And um, we were talking about an interesting problem that he was facing, and so once you're talking about a scale of, say, making a million of something, if you can save one cent on your bomb cost, then it's worth spending up to ten thousand dollars of engineering time to optimize out that one cent. So, That's right. Yep. Uh, so in this particular case, say you've got a tantalum capacitor that might cost you six cents, and you want to swap it out with a one cent ceramic. So that's going to save you five cents, which means you can put fifty thousand dollars of engineering time into making that change. But right, and most of that fifty thousand dollars is testing, right? <laughs> um, partly, but this is the interesting thing that came up with this conversation in the front with my friend. Um, in this particular case, they had um, some noise coming from some motors, 
And uh, <clears throat> so these motors were affecting a magnetometer and they could put cost into the hardware and filter out the noise or they could let the noise through and then put a lot of development work into software filtering to remove it after you get the value out of the magnetometer. Mm. And nice. Uh, yeah, it's one of those situations where it's worth spending $50,000 of coding time to write the software filters to deal with the noise rather than use a six cent tantalum in place of a one cent ceramic. So it, it still fascinates me when you look at that very high end that a few cents here and there is worth tens of thousands of dollars of effort just to achieve that little saving. So most of the time, yeah. of course, when you're working on a project, you're, um, it's much more balanced than that. You might be designing something that is going to be made in the thousands or tens of thousands quantities, maybe up to hundreds of thousands. So it's quite rare right, to work on right, a project right. where the ultimate goal is you're going to make one board and that's the board that's going to go into space and it can't fail under any circumstances. Right. Or you're going to make five million of this thing and every fraction of a cent matters. So those are extremes, but I always find it's fun to look at extremes and get my head around what the constraints are because it means that as you are designing your solution to the problem, the um, the constraints you're working with can be totally different. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, and it drives a different set of skills, right? I mean, like the people I know who do work at toy... Uh, well, I guess I had this a little bit as well, where I just I, I had this I went from like a test equipment company to a industrial company, and it wasn't even that big of a shift, but it was just a you know super high end uh, mid range, and it's just you uh, you can't you know when you're going from that super high end to mid range, it's like you you don't worry as much about every little thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's more about speed. It's more about whatever. Yes. Yeah. What is I guess I guess most of the stuff you were doing in the past has mostly been cost optimized. What what I mean it's low volume though, right? Um, Lowish volume. It's in the past surprisingly not it hasn't been cost optimized because the volume is fairly low and in the early days of Arduino, you know, an Arduino board would cost um I remember paying 40 something dollars for one Damn. of the early like a, a genuine <laughs> Arduino in the early days. And of course, things have changed now, but um, I think this is possibly the um, the bit of the middle road problem that Freetronics is in right now. So we're still trying to make the good quality boards, but compete against um, against the really budget manufacturers who have trimmed every cent out of it that they can. Right. So yep. um, it's disheartening sometimes when I look at, uh, you know, you go to eBay and you look for a cheap Arduino clone. And um, their retail price is less than, you know, half of my bill of materials cost. <laughs> right, <It's>, exactly. <laughs> I just scratch my head and say, how the hell is that happening? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, you never really want to compete on price. Even the ones that are, quote unquote, competing on price is more like the industry they're in, right? So like the toy industry is just, there are almost ceilings on 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 toys, right? Like certain mm. classes of toys can only cost so much, right? Yes, so, yeah, there, there are these price points that everybody has to hit, like the $99 and $149 and $49.95, right, exactly, yeah. that sort of thing. So I was really surprised constraints. by that that recent, uh, did you see that car that Sphero made? The uh, it was a, It's actually, it's beautifully designed. It's um, So the, the Sphero folks, they they made a car, like a promotional toy for the new Cars 3 movie. And it's, so it's like the Lightning McQueen and it's like 300 bucks though. And it's like, so that's what double that BB-8 was. And, um, but it's got like six, so it's got like six motors on it. It's got like a, like the, the cars, um, where the car's eyes are usually in the screen. It actually has like a, like an LC, mini LCD and stuff like that. And it's just, and it's all Bluetooth controlled. And I mean, like everything about it is just really nice. But then I saw the price tag and I'm like, wow, that is, <laughs> that's barely a toy at that point, right? And it's like, yeah. I, I, I'm not getting that for my nephew, I'll tell you that much. Yes. <laughs> that, if I get that toy, it's for me, even though I don't like the movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It sounds like the sort of thing where um, someone like us would pull it apart and be fascinated by the engineering that went into it. A bit oh, like yeah. that. Um, ridiculous juice press that we probably shouldn't oh, get yeah. into now. <laughs> no, definitely um, not. We've we've talked about that yeah, a bit, and yeah, uh, yeah. it is actually yes. interesting looking at products like that and 
um, because it's an example of an extreme in engineering. It's one of those you know, don't cut any corners, do everything as right. well as you can situation. Yep. Mm. Yeah, the, actually, so Fictive did a, a teardown of the the Lightning Ultimate Lightning McQueen teardown. So it's yeah, it's I mean, kind of like the exploded view of everything that's in there too. Even just like having more than one circuit board in a toy is like that. <laughs> that alone is like whoa, wait a second, you know, like two fully blown. Yeah. So, anyways, that's that's a that's a nice little toy. So, so, <laughs> so many so many words. <laughs> So yeah, somewhere between there and super low end, right? I mean, like that is those those are the things that you have to deal with. And it seems like, um, you know, I was talking to a friend about industrial stuff the other day. I think it's actually really interesting in the industrial space of like accessible tools that are usable in a factory, right? So like ruggedized electronics. I I I, I still think that that's a an interesting space for people in you know your position, my position, whatever, right? Where it's it's going to be low volume. It's going to be high mix. It's going to be, um, you know, it could even be slow or kind of expensive. Like all of these these weird corners there, but it's because it's it's super customized for the for the needs that yes. they go for it, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. And um, in fact, many of our boards, there's a, it's kind of parallel to the industrial application is farming. Um, oh yeah, right. I found that, and many I kind of put those in the same in the same bucket, really. Yeah, yeah, that's right. They've got a lot of the same constraints and the same or similar environmental issues. Um, right, exactly. Going to be, uh, you know, hot and cold environments, and stuff gets wet, and all of those bad things. So you really have right. to make things that are able to withstand that. So uh, every now and then, a, a lot of the time, we just ship boards and we don't hear anything else. We've got no idea what happened to them. But every now and then we'll get people coming back to us and saying, oh, I use your board in this particular application or whatever. And that sort of thing is always fascinating to hear. I think that's one of the things that's uh, that's really interesting about providing general purpose boards. That It's not a finished product. It's something that people build into other things. So we see all mm. sorts of crazy applications. Right, and, exactly. Uh, yeah, so I've had a surprising number of people come back to me and say that they've used them in farm automation. Things like mm. um, monitoring environmental conditions inside a chicken shed, uh, and then you know displaying the data in real time up on some big uh, status board, and those sorts of things. So, I think just that's like a very interesting count, thing. That's how many things it is. <laughs> it's just like there are four eggs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's sort of scale. It's more like there are forty thousand eggs. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Well, yeah, and that's and that's the crazy thing too. Is like. Like that's why it's almost industrial, where it gets it gets big pretty quick on some of these farms. They're 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 the big operations. Yeah, and often they're doing it with surprisingly few people. Yeah, there's um, uh, there was one very interesting conversation I had recently with um, with an electrical engineer who is working on equipment for milking cattle, and mm, yep, so. I've seen um, a number of systems set up for automated milking, but they still involve people and they involve the cow being put into like a very confined space and they're stressed and that sort of thing. And um, so what they've done is build a system. Cow massage chairs. <laughs> almost. <laughs> it sounds almost <laughs> that luxurious. Yeah. Um, so, and the thing is that in a typical milking situation, because there are humans involved, you want to get them all through in a short space of time. So there's always this time pressure and they do it early in the morning and rush them through one after another. There's lots of stress involved and then the farmer can go off and do whatever else they need to do. And in this particular system, what they've done is there are three farms um, just outside Melbourne where they have set up a system which has a totally robotic milking system and the, uh, the actual uh, suction cups are applied automatically by the robot um, using vision processing and all sorts of things, um, the system scans the um, the ID of each particular cow and right. They get like a tag on their ear yeah, or something. Yeah, that's right. It uses RFID or whatever. Um, you better and, watch out if you go there, buddy. Oh no, I, <laughs> I don't want to be <laughs> milked. <laughs> getting milked, yeah. <laughs> um, and the way the system is set up, it's all done basically on the cow schedule. So. They can be yeah. milked at any time of the day because there's, there are no humans involved. The cow walks through the mechanism that does it 
the food is provided to them and it's all done very gently and slowly and the machinery doesn't make noise so they're not stressed out and the interesting thing is that um, they, these, ca um, these cattle can go months without seeing a human <laughs> and the machine just the, takes care of them automatically uh, and it also does things like um, automatically check the quality of the milk so um, right, right, and right. it also dishes out the feed individually. So every um, cow, as it's being milked, it's been identified. It's also been weighed and various other things have been checked. So the quality of its milk has been checked automatically by the computer. And so they can be given a tailored feed that gives them enough food, gives them what particular supplements that specific cow needs, um, regardless of anything else in the herd. And I'm so, imagining like uh, feeding it chocolate for getting chocolate milk. Is that, is that, what, I'm, <laughs> is that what I'm hearing? Is that... <laughs> uh, I don't think it works that way. <laughs> I know. I know. I also but, saw uh, this really sad statistic the other day that said like 30% of Americans thinks that <laughs> think chocolate milk comes, comes from brown it. cows. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's probably a fake statistic. It's fine. But like, yeah. but even like it's that there's one about. person that thinks that is <laughs> <laughs> uh, sad. <laughs> yeah. I find yeah. it really interesting to to hear about projects like this because it's such an interesting engineering problem and it is, dealing but, with but is it is it economical that's what i always get back to right i mean like i can make a robot that does anything but it's <laughs> yeah is give, it give you enough money and economical. enough time mm. yeah exactly right yeah um well i don't know about the, the economics of that particular project and um, I also should be upfront. I actually can't make a robot that built anything. I, <laughs> I, I, I have very few robotic skills. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you'd, you'd have a pretty good go at it. Sure. Um, yes. It would definitely get near the cow. <laughs> <laughs> the cow might be in danger. <laughs> right. It may end up making hamburger more than anything, but yes. <laughs> but either way, someone's getting fed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I think that's one of the things that really fascinates me about this industry is that there are so many different types of projects like that for people to work on. Uh, I, I love talking right. to engineers because everyone I talk to who comes out with some amazing story like this, like I built a robot that milks cows and nobody has to go near them. It all happens automatically or, you know, something like that. And uh yeah. Well, that kind of brings it back to the consulting thing too, because it's it, it gets really so like consulting is usually like I need I need someone to build me this thing to go into the rest of the system where it's you know like building a, a sub circuit of or subsection of a, a system right, but that kind of like top to bottom, uh, like like a cow milking system right. How often are electronics people talking to dairy farmers and and then being like oh well you should build a robot for this right? Usually what a dairy farmer would say is well you should like you know, increase the efficiency of my workers or you should do all this other stuff. It's kind of like this, it's like these mental leaps where it's like, well, we might as well try this other thing. But there, you know, you have to have also find not just someone who's looking for a solution to a problem, but is also willing to fund and or try out something a little bit more unconventional. Yeah, yeah. You really need that serendipitous connection. Um, someone within the particular industry or area of need that is thinking about the problem and someone else that comes up with a radical solution to it, not just can we make this thing 5% better, but you know, can we do this in a totally different way? And uh, it's really interesting when those sorts of things happen. Yeah, right, exactly. It's like the whole, uh, if I would have asked what people what they wanted, they would have asked for more buggy whips or whatever <laughs> yeah, the, right. the Ford quote is. Yeah, yes. like that kind of thing, right? Yeah. yeah. So, all right, so all we need to do is find you some rich farmers and we'll, you know, you can go make your uh, your milking robots or well, I guess I guess that part's done. So, um, whatever kind of other robots are out there, <laughs> I could spend all day on YouTube watching, like especially with food. Like food is especially, especially it feels like um, the the packaging and like the cooking side of it, like the the really industrial side of things. Man, those YouTube videos are just magical to watch. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah, like the uh, one I remember the frozen pizza one. Have you ever seen that one? It's like, a, so it's inside like a frozen pizza factory and it's just, you know, they, they, sh it, cause it's all, it's soup to nuts, you know, it's like starting with flour and then making the actual dough and cutting out the things and, and applying all this stuff. And it's not just like one at a time either. They're doing like 20 at a time, like in like parallel fashion. It's just, it's an unbelievable process. Yeah. So I'll mm. see if I, I'll see if I can link that yeah, in actually. Yeah, i that. It is a, that is a fun video. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, many years ago, 
uh, the father of a friend of mine was a mechanical engineer and um, he worked at a local ice cream factory and worked on the machines for making the ice creams. So oh, man. it was interesting to hear things like um, how, uh, yeah, how the machines are made. So if you, if you think about this as an engineering problem, we want to make an ice cream on a stick. Like, how do you get it into the mold? How do you get the stick in the right yeah. place when the ice cream is freezing? How do you then right. get it out yep. and into the packaging? How do you seal the packaging? It's a whole right. lot of problems to solve along the way. Yeah, those yeah, those are and 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 like I said, the parallel stuff too. It's like anyone can make one ice cream like that, but now you have to make a bunch and you have to do it like in time. You know, you gotta like and you gotta this whole thing's gotta move through the system. It's not like you can have someone reach into a freezer and pull it out. It's like no, it has to like flash freeze as it's moving through. And yeah, those kind of those kind of problems are yeah. And if you crazy change anything about the way the production line is running, then your timing changes on the freeze cycle and everything gets screwed up. So yeah. Oh yeah, it's true. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah, yeah, I heard about bad days when um, some machine would fail and they'd end up having to drop an, a whole batch of ice cream. So, and it didn't yeah. like end up in your friend's freezer. Is that no? <laughs> oh, that's that's too bad. Yeah, you say yeah. You come home from the factory with like <laughs> yeah, we've got, got sixty thousand boxes of ice cream. creams. I need I need you to eat them before they melt. <laughs> okay, Quick. dad. Grab a spoon. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> See, yeah, mm. that would be that'd be great. <laughs> So what are you excited about in the industry these days? I mean, I guess it's been, I mean, it's been five years since, and not since we talked. I should mention too, that thank you for hanging out with me when I was in Melbourne. It was fun. I oh mean, yeah, that uh, was great. We went and flew drones and yep. got food and everything was great. Yeah. So. I, yeah, I think I nearly killed you with one of them. <laughs> it was uh, a yep, bit out yep. of control. <laughs> the dogs were in greater danger oh, than yeah, I was. Yeah. 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 Um, dogs don't realize that drones are flying chainsaws. So they just think it's right. something They're fun to like, play hey, with. They're just like, hey, funny, noisy oh, thing. Moving. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Flashing lights. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that's been a lot of fun recently. Uh, a little while ago, I um, I did some post on Facebook, I think, saying, "Oh, I'd really like to play around with drones." And I had a whole bunch of people contact me and saying, "Hey, I've got some spare parts. I'll send them to you." So I ended yeah, up with right. this big grab box full of random bits and pieces, like speed controllers and motors and props and things. So I bit of I clutched together um, a drone and ended up having to buy a few parts along the way as well. And, as you uh, do, yep. yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it, that was a really interesting experience. It's um, it's is that thing flying now? The one that almost ran into us? <laughs> that... <laughs> it's flying approximately as well as when you saw it. <laughs> okay, all right. So it hasn't um, hit any I'd... solid objects in a while. So no, it hasn't. Um, I just recently got GPS working on it, which means I'll be able to do position hold. So the problem mm. when we were flying it out in the park was that I didn't have GPS working. It was just drifting around all over the place. And I'm not exactly a good pilot. So um. <laughs> I, think, I think that's hard with anyone. Like, I, I think that's, that's, that's going to be a challenge as people get more and more used to these commercial drones too, where they kind of just stand where they are. They just stay where they are. It's like, there's a lot going into making that stay. Oh, yes, that's right. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it's yeah. like it's like got all the control systems. It's got the GPS stuff. It's got sometimes yeah, it's, got it's got ground barometer. sensors, yeah. barometer, you know, right, sonar. exactly. Yeah. Yep, it's um, crazy. And they're often doing image processing now as well. So they can have... Yeah, like the look downs? Yeah, the look down to check whether they're moving relative to the ground. They can do... Um, some of them have forward-looking cameras for collision avoidance. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So the I think the current um phantom 4 has forward looking collision avoidance so you can basically like fly it at a house and it'll just refuse to run into it it'll <laughs> it'll approach it and then just stop so <laughs> it's um it's almost uncrashable and that sort of thing is amazing because as you say there are so <laughs> challenge many challenge accepted <laughs> <laughs> yes. there are so many different um inputs into the control system so yeah. it's getting your right. input saying go forward and it's getting the um the collision detection saying no nope, stop right. Yeah, like all that, uh, and 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 that's the other thing. It's like it's like layer on layer on layer too, because like the the IMUs that are in there, the like the nine axis sensor fusion output craziness, right? Like we're just spoiled these days, you know. Like oh, it's like yes. stop putting like a like just like three coordinates or something like that, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And I have no idea how any of it works. Let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> just... <laughs> yeah, it's 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 cool. It's a cool time. And like, have you seen that fold up one that uh, DJI has now? Oh, too? the little spark. Yeah. Yeah. My God, yeah, my friend NBA took my friend went to Ireland for a week, mm -hmm. and he just like threw it up in the air, and he took like this 4K footage. It's just like 
I don't even know how movie makers stay in the business anymore. Like, I like, what is left? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, whatever. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, I was amazed the first time I flew a Phantom Three, and uh-huh. it really does just take after its look after itself. So you take off, go up into the air. You can just take your hands off the controls, and it will just sit there. It'll stay where you put it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Waiting for next command. <laughs> yeah. Master. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, but there, I've seen some incredible footage of um, first-person view flyers as well. Oh, there's like the racing a, stuff? Yeah, that's insane. Yeah. Um, there's uh, a local Aussie guy who has a YouTube channel um, called UAV Futures, and he talks about all sorts of drones and things and um, does first-person view racing. And a little while ago, he put up a video of, um, I think it's the current Australian champion, who's like a young kid, he's like 12 years old or something. <laughs> right. <And> he's, <laughs> he's got those classic video game reflexes. And you see video from the point of view camera of the drone as it's zipping through these gates and things. And I can barely even follow it. And right. somehow he's controlling it in real time. Right. Use the force, Anakin. Use yeah. the force. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. yeah, that's crazy. Um, but speaking of fast <laughs> reactions, so that's human control. Um, one of the other videos I just saw recently was the little Japanese sumo robots. Oh, yeah. They you sent me that. crazy. Yeah. They're so fast. So, uh... what about... So, yeah, we posted this on the on the channel, too. Um, are these pre-programmed? I could, I could not figure it out. I don't know. Um, I assume, because they're so fast that I was having trouble believing that anyone was controlling them. Um, yeah, exactly, so, right? Uh, so, just to give listeners some concept... Um, they have it, it's a sumo battle between two robots, and they have to push yeah. each other out of a circle. So they yeah, have they kind of look like bulldozer. Yeah, bulldo- they're like little dozers, bulldozers, right? but like the yeah. size of half a shoebox, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they start on opposite sides of this disc, and their job is to bash the other one out of the circle. And um, when I first heard about this, my concept was, you know, they'd move about as quickly as a radio-controlled car, sort of thing, which is fast, yeah. but not that fast. But these things are just like lightning, like blink your eyes and they're like zipping around all over the place and smashing each other. And well, the thing that's that's about RC cars is like they might be able to get to a speed, but they're not like super like jerky, right? They, they can't like start and stop. These things are like tuned, like control system tuned so that they can just stop on a dime and rotate and like all, all this crazy shit. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. they're staying within this circle, which looks like it's about a meter or maybe slightly larger oh, yeah. in diameter. It's not yeah, a very not big, big area. So they're zipping around in this very confined space without running over the edge and bashing each other up. Uh, yep. It's very entertaining to watch. <laughs> it really is. Did you, did you notice too that there's, so there's the, uh, there's the referee or whatever, but, but yes. he's wearing shin guards. <laughs> did you notice that? <laughs> yes. And um, yeah. in one of the videos, there were some crash barriers around and yeah, bits flying off. Oof, um, but right yeah. near the end of the video, someone is holding a remote control and that made me oh, wonder, okay. maybe they are manually controlled, but it could be that they just use that for arming it. Like once they're ready to go, oh, the referee says go, go, then you hit yeah, go. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I have trouble believing that a, um, that a human is in the control loop for these things because they are so fast. Right. Well, and the other question though is too, like, so, okay, so say they are programmed, is it just like they're like open loop, just do this do this pirouette and then, you know, hope that you kind of... Yeah, hope that you're going to crash other the other one somewhere, somehow. Or, yeah. is there, or is there some kind of feedback where it's like, oh, ping sensor, we're well, not even ping, that would be too slow, but like some kind of sensor that's like proximity, whatever, yes. and then react based on that. Yeah, well, some of them did seem to be targeting each other, so I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> we're talking about something that we don't know the answers to, but it's very entertaining Welcome to, to the watch. Amp hour. <laughs> this is the amp hour. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Super fun project, though. Yeah, definitely. Mm. So, what's next for you? I mean, what are you what are you going to be building just for fun? Um, I'm always working. What are on a you few building things. right now? I yeah, suppose. a few things. Um, so, I suppose if you look at what I have at PCB layout stage, but haven't yet sent out for Fab, um, there are a couple of things. One of them is a board that I'm working on to retrofit Wi-Fi into electric window motors. Now, this is oh, related cool. to a project that I did a little while ago for Superhouse. There, mm-hmm. In my house, I have electric blinds and motors to open and close windows. And the motors themselves have an interface on them called LIN, which is um, it's commonly used in vehicle yeah, electrical lo- Local systems. interface network, right? Yeah, that's right. It's like there's it's CAN like and a, LIN. LIN yeah. is like the, the is, car window. LIN is like CAN light. 
So it's right. A it's like the ones version. you don't care as much about, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, it's much lower speed, much simpler implementation, and so um, these uh, these motors have Lin built into them, but it can be a bit of a pain to set up. And I did a, a Superhouse episode a while ago about making a Lin interface and um, and then controlling them from the home automation system. But I've just been playing around. One of the things that these motors have is a built-in battery compartment. So you can either plug in an external power source or you can just run them off four AA batteries. And oh, um, got it. the batteries themselves need to be replaced from time to time. It's a bit of a pain. So if you're going to do it properly, you'd want to run external power to it so you never have to care about the batteries. So it sits there with this empty battery compartment. And um, so what I've designed is... A circuit board which is elongated and it's a bit of an odd shape with two slots in it so that it can clip in place of the four batteries and then a jumper cable that runs around and plugs into the LIN interface so that um, it's basically like a piggyback control board and the yeah, idea is right. you can pop the cover off the existing motor plug this little board in where the batteries used to be and now you've got Wi-Fi um, control of your window motor so yeah. Yeah, that's just an nice. interesting little project that I'm hacking around on. What are you, what are you using the wife for the Wi-Fi? Are you doing ESP? ESP, yeah. Um, yeah. I've got ESP8266 on these. Um, I'm wondering whether I should swap it out and put an ESP32 on it. Um, so, I think the sourcing would be a little tougher for that if you yeah. get to that. I mean, like right now at least, maybe in a couple months it'd yeah, be fine. Yeah, that's right. It's at that changeover point. Um, yeah. yeah it, that's an interesting process as well. Um one of my friends works at es Espressif, which is the company behind the ESP. <laughs> right, and, right. Um, I, th I think I met him. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you did, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Together. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so shout out to Angus. And, yes. Um, and thanks for the ride up to the, to the drone thing, Angus, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I had lunch with him a couple of days ago, and we were talking about the ESP8266 and now the ESP32. And um, mm. so the issue is that ESP8266 has become so popular and people have built it into so many things that it becomes the go-to thing that you reach for when you want cheap Wi-Fi. So now the ESP32 is coming out, which has many advantages over it. It's yeah, more memory, point, it has Bluetooth, all that stuff. Yeah, right? yeah, more radios yeah. in there. Um, yep. uh, but it, I was just saying to Angus that my reflex when I was designing this board was go for an ESP8266 just because that's stuck in my head, even though I could just go for an ESP32 instead. And I possibly should just for, I don't know why. Yeah, like future-proofing <laughs> yeah, almost. Future -proofing, it's like, it's yeah, future-proofing. It's the newer right. chip. Why go for the old one when the new one is here? Right. Um, well, that's so an interesting that point inertia. too because there's people who've done that before. I mean, I, I think this is a pretty low low impact kind of experiment, right? But like pe people have done that before and they've said, I'm going to move to the next generation. And then the next generation just never takes off, right? Because... The previous generation gets cheaper or there there's just too much um engagement with the older generation type thing it, it has happened before in the past and it's an interesting question on whether you should yeah well <laughs> for my particular little personal project it really doesn't matter but <laughs> right well, it, um, yes low it, impact yes. yeah <laughs> um, it's just that i became aware while i was talking to him that i'd made this um engineering decision without actually stopping to think about it i'd made it totally out of reflex it was just yeah, oh that's what right. i have done before so i'll stick that footprint on the board and we're done um yeah i mean it depends though too right you're you're making prototypes right i mean that i, I think that's almost always okay for prototypes. maybe it's different with processors because that has a much bigger implication in terms of like okay you can't have more memory in the future switch there's a higher switching cost but like if i build a prototype and i put an lm317 on there there's not really that much implication other than like dropout voltage, right? And 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 I can always go and redo that later, you know what I mean? Like un unless I really mess something up with that first iteration, I don't know. I think prototyping it's not a huge deal. It's like it's it's when you take it, if you then didn't do anything, you go okay, this is going to production now, and you don't. That's when you say, I'm not going to take a look at this again. That's when you can really yes. get into trouble. Yeah, and um, yeah. that really comes down to the point at which you start doing optimization. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's an old software um, saying that premature optimization is the root of all evil yeah. um, <laughs> because <laughs> nice. a lot of people start to think about uh, optimizing things as they are designing it, which is not necessarily right. when you yeah. know what needs to be optimized. 
Exactly. So, yeah. yeah. Right, and, you, and most of the time, you're just trying to prove, like, I mean, you, you might realize that you don't even like the motor in the original device. I mean, obviously, you've already been using it, but, you know, similar kind of things where, yeah, you don't know what you're actually... Most of the time when you're prototyping, you don't actually know what you're even looking for, right? Yeah. It's the point of a prototype. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's... Um, I don't know. I've, I've still been trying to do that better this year. This this year has been my year of getting faster at prototyping, and half a year in, I'm I'm still not much faster. But yeah, I'm trying, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, apart good. from that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Apart from that, I'm working on a few different things. Um, probably not anything that's radic- you know, that's particularly interesting. <clears throat> but um, one of the little boards that I've also just been working on is once again ESP8266 based. It's a little board that I can use to hack into an existing remote control for something. And um, this is solving the problem of you've got an appliance of some kind. It comes with a remote control, you know, like a garage door opener or whatever. Yeah, right, right. And yep. there are several different ways of solving the problem of linking that into something else. And um, it's so you can emulate the protocol and have your own transmitter or whatever. Um, and it sounds really nasty and hacky, but I found that one of the best ways to get around this problem is rip out one of the um, the factory remote controls and just wire across the back of the buttons and mm, yep. trigger it and send just, the signal yeah and yep. um i've actually done that so many times now with different devices that i have like a semi-standardized little arduino shield layout where um i have outputs that switch the um you know the buttons on the remote control but it's always very um <clears throat> <clears throat> very labor intensive to make it because there are lots of little jumper wires and bits and pieces. So right. yeah, and then you could have like the jumper wire might break, and that's yeah, kind of a point. That's of right. Yeah. So it's got to the point where when I'm faced with doing this, I sort of sigh and go, "Oh no, I've got to sit there with jumper wires and make this up, and it's going to be a bit of a pain." So I've got to the point where I've said, "Stuff this! I'm going to design a board for this purpose." So I've designed a little circuit board that fits into a standard size plastic project box. It's got the ESP8266 and a little switch mode power supply down one end. And about half of the circuit board is a blank space. So what you can do is take your little remote control and basically stick it on the PCB, bridge across a couple of wires, and you're done. So, uh, yeah. I don't know if anyone else so, will care so about that, but <laughs> no, no, that's, it's solving that's good, my actually. particular problem. And so you never, uh, you do you ever do the thing where you try and like capture the like do like a replay basically? Oh so yeah, you, like definitely. you capture yeah yeah capture um, the IR and then replay the IR. Or how do yeah, you, how do you um, deal with and that? radio as well. So I've yeah. done quite a bit of that, and okay. uh, in fact, I've got several boards, um, several products that Freetronic sells specifically for that purpose. Um, oh really? Which like, ones? There is a four thirty three megahertz receiver shield. <clears throat> which is you basically plug it into an Arduino and then you get a raw waveform coming out that um, so if you're uh, there are a couple of frequencies that are really common just because they are in the unlicensed band there's 433 megahertz um, and a couple of others 315 megahertz it's country dependent but what I've found in Australia at least just about everything transmits at 433 megahertz things like you know once again garage door openers but you know, power mm-hmm. board, remote controls, and whatever. So this yeah. is assuming they're radio, they're not IR. And um, so I've done um, quite a bit of uh, work. And in fact, I did a conference talk about this, and there's a video of it up online um, about uh, hacking, or basically reverse engineering communications protocols for IoT devices. And um, so I've used it in the past for things like intercepting data coming from wireless weather stations. Oh, cool. And from um, power monitoring systems. So, you know, those things where you clip a current clamp around a wire and then inside your house you have a little display that says you are using, you know, 2.3 kilowatts or whatever. Um, they use the similar thing. There's a little transmitter where the sensor is located that's measuring the power usage. It's just blindly transmitting on 433 megahertz. And so... Um, I've got some code that uses our receiver shield. It just intercepts that signal, and then you can um, you can log how much power you're using. So oh, cool. I've done lots of those sorts of projects in the past, where I look at the protocol, um, and I often do that with something like a um, like a, an amateur receiver. So I got my amateur radio license a little while ago, and I've got like a handheld um, transceiver, 
So you tune that to the right frequency and you can get a raw waveform coming out of it and mm -hmm. open it up on your computer and you can actually see the shape of the, um, the data. It's, it's actually one of those things that's quite cool. It's very crude, <laughs> but it works. So you can, um, you receive the signal on your radio and you get that, um, you know, the classic modem screech buzz coming out of it, which yeah, is the right, data yeah, going yeah, through. Yeah. And yeah. to you, it just sounds like a screech, but if you record it and then open it in an audio player on your computer that shows the shape of the waveform, all of a sudden right. you can see it's binary data. Yeah, so, it's like down sample to like 40 kilohertz yeah, or something like that. That's or, right. Yeah. So yeah. you can sit there and decode it by hand if you want to. <laughs> and then um, mm, pass. <laughs> yeah, but sometimes that's necessary the first time. Like if you don't know what the actual structure of the message is. Right. So you need to figure out, you know, what's the preamble, what's the actual payload data how does the checksum work so oh so are you saying you're actually you are reverse engineering you're yeah, not just you're yeah. not just doing replay it's exactly like, yeah okay does do do most of the products that you do this to do you do you find that they have some kind of protection against a replay attack <laughs> nope <laughs> yeah i wouldn't think so. i mean like yeah it's okay. it is ridiculous um yeah. one of the uh, in fact this was part of the point of the conference talk that i did uh, I demonstrated, I started ordering things online because you just I, want to find one I that doesn't have find, this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I started becoming even more ridiculous. Like I ordered um, wireless infrared motion detectors. So the uh -huh. sort of thing that you use in a security system, mm -hmm. I ordered a few different types from different manufacturers and they just blast out data. So <laughs> the scary thing is that you can sit outside someone's house and read the data from their motion detectors. Yeah. And there's, there's no protection. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, when we had Sammy on, he he told us about a lot of this stuff, and I remember Sammy told us about that. I think Joe mentioned that a little bit. Joe, we just had Joe uh, Fitzpatrick on a couple of weeks ago, and like, yeah, I mean, this, maybe maybe you have a future as a security researcher too. You know, like, uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know, man. Yeah, it's it's scary. You know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the things that I like to do is take things that were never intended to be connected to the internet and connect them. <laughs> that's yeah, just yeah, that's great. one of my little hobbies. So, uh, <laughs> which, which all falls into that home automation thing as well. And you take it. <laughs> you have it like and... uh, when you, when you, when you like, uh, have it transmit on the internet, do you have it say anything snarky? <laughs> like, hey, I'm a stupid fridge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I should do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Not everything needs a Twitter account. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, this stupid fridge is at 32C. <laughs> it's broken. <laughs> it's your on food fire. Is bad. <laughs> yeah. Right. Don't eat it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Well, that's cool. No, that, that's good too. I mean, like, uh, and I finally I found the uh, the uh, the shield you were talking about too. So, all oh, right, it is it is still for sale on your site, right? I mean, yep. like the yeah rece sure. receiver shield. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Mm, and that's good, man. Um, I actually did another project uh, outside of Freetronics. I did it for Superhouse, and I made a little board which is an add-on for a Raspberry Pi. It's essentially an Arduino with a 433 megahertz transmitter and a receiver connected to the Arduino, but it's in a form factor that lets a Raspberry Pi plug into it and then it communicates oh, cool. over the serial yeah. interface. So what happens is that the, uh, the Arduino can receive a, like a random 433 megahertz signal and it can also transmit whatever signal you want it to. And it passes that also, information also back to the Pi. Yeah, also on 433. Okay. So what it means is that I can um, have it do things like, uh, and then I run OpenHab on the Raspberry Pi, which is an open source home automation um, management, like a, uh, a hub, I suppose you would call it, where yeah, you can put yeah, in yeah. rules and get mm -hmm. it to do things. So what I've done is set it up so that the so that OpenHab can say, I want to send a code that controls this blind, and then that blind opens when it sends a signal. So. Right. Um, yeah, I've made quite a few of those now. I've just been doing those on the side, and um, oh, that's cool. Um, yeah, there are probably I think about thirty houses now that have those installed nice. around Melbourne. What, do, what is the what is the range on those uh, on those four thirty three receiver transmitters? Um, it varies a lot depending on the quality of the module itself, but they they typically will easily do thirty meters. So oh. 100 feet. Oh, that's not bad. Yeah. yeah. And like through walls and stuff too? 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. So oh, normally, nice. if you put one of these in a house, it'll mm-hmm. cover the house. Unless right. it happens and to you be could probably do or, like repeaters and stuff like yeah, that, right? Yeah, that's what I've done. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for a number of houses that I've installed these in, <clears throat> they, <clears throat> they've been rather crazy properties to say the least like um <laughs> so these are uh, maybe higher end clients yes. is that what you're trying to say yes, that's right <laughs> <laughs> wait 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 is the housing market in australia a little bit uh the high end that's weird uh, <laughs> i didn't notice that when i was there no, well <laughs> not the ones that i normally see but um yeah, yeah, right. yeah for, for some customers that i've set up home automation systems for their yeah you need a segway or something to get around the house yeah exactly right <laughs> no that's what um, i expected i i mean like i meant that it is like high-end <clears throat> yes high-end customers i assume have big houses right yeah yeah that's right <laughs> yeah so in those situations you sometimes have to set up multiple transmitters and have them all um, linked together so it sends it from the transmitter that is nearest the destination Mm-hmm. that's cool and they'll just like pass messages on like so it's like do you have endpoint 35 near you no i don't pass it on to the next one do you have end thir- endpoint 39 five near you no i don't pass it on to the next one like that kind of idea um the ones i've set up i don't have it learning that what i do is configure it so that i have a list of endpoints and it says you know these endpoints are associated with this transmitter these ones with that transmitter so it just, oh so there's like a lookup table somewhere yeah okay. yeah that's right i see it's um cool i normally configure that in open hub so it's just a list of all of the devices around the house, which could be lights, blinds, you know, heating, yeah. whatever, door locks. Hmm. Do you uh, do you commit the cardinal sin of IoT in that uh, you don't have? Do you still have switch localized switch control, or is it all all by wire or well wireless? I suppose. Um, I like if they, if they hit a finger switch on the wall, does it still control the light, or does oh, right. it, yes, or does yes. it completely replace the switch? No. Um, I really don't like it when it's hard for people to come into a house and use it. And I am guilty of the sin of, um, of making my house harder for guests to use. And um, so in my it's a security house, measure, folks, <laughs> yes, um, there was a, um, there was a project a few years ago that I wasn't directly involved in, but one of my friends worked on it. And the brief from the homeowner was that they didn't want a single switch in the entire house. So oh, God. his objective was that everything would be automatic. So you walk into a room and the lights turn on. And um, I just imagine myself in the dark, waving my arms <laughs> yeah, like, Hello, wildly, being here, like, what I'm is here. going on here? <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, so that was what the customer wanted. And the um, the engineers argued against it and said, no, no, you really need some <laughs> You may have to sell well. your house at some point, <laughs> sir. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then it needs to be totally rewired. So Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so I've seen that done and uh, I don't like that approach. I do like the approach where things happen uh, automatically. So things should sure, just behave yeah. the way they should. But you also yeah. want some sense of control. And if you want to walk into a room and turn a light on, you should be able to do that without pulling out your mobile phone. And uh, right. this really... Also without, without a touchpad, I think. That's yes. another thing. Yeah. 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 I think touchpads should be a supplementary thing where you want extra sure, functionality, sure. not just... Um, replacing a um, a switch with an entire touch right. screen. You, if you want to change the color palette of your room, fine, yeah, right? If you want to turn the switch on, if you want to turn the light on, just hit. A I'm switch. sorry, the switch. We are we it's are at that point. Binary in, in the, control. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Until, until until I'm talking to the computer for everything, and even then, I probably don't want to turn a switch on like that. You know? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So in my house, what I have are um, light switches in all of the normal places where you would expect them. Mm-hmm. But instead of the normal rocker switch, there are push button. And when oh, you push it, it sends a command to the home automation system. So it knows, oh, they've pressed this button and I need to turn mm. this light on. So like basically what it does is um, <laughs> it, it puts software control into the middle of it. And you're not directly controlling it because power isn't going through the switch. The switch is just right, like a control right. input. But it also means that if you turn a light on with your phone, you can then walk over to the wall and push the button and the light will turn off again. It's um, it's just mm. another way of controlling the same thing. I don't like that one, but it's your house, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but so, yeah, that's... Uh, so you don't like the fact that there is the, the software link in the middle? Exactly. Yeah, that's and that's like a, that's like a soft power off button, right? Like, and like those, yeah, because then like what happens when this, what happens when the software locks up? Yeah. 
Yeah, that like, is. The I still want to. I want the button to work, mm -hmm. even if the software's dead. Yes. And that doesn't. That doesn't fit that. Yes, that's true. So, yeah. Yeah. So I have. Um, yeah, that's a compromise that I've made. Yeah. Well. Mm. You know. Yeah. It's okay. You you know you know the trade offs more than more than most. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And also you know how to fix the software if it does lock up. So that's the other thing. I'm like. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, that has been a bit frustrating recently. There have been some. There's been some weird memory leak issues in OpenHab, I think. Maybe in oh, Java. Yeah. And you you posted about this. This was one of your one of your Superhouse episodes, yeah. wasn't it? About about going off to like uh, USB servers on Amazon or something. Yes, that's right. So yeah. um, this was. This isn't my system, and in fact, uh, this was some other system that I saw where controlling it required use of an external service. So right. you might have a light switch in your house and a light that it's controlling, but when you press that switch, it's sending a signal off to some server halfway around the world, and then yeah. it's sending a command back to the light saying, hey, you need to turn on now. And right. that sort of thing just seems ridiculous to me. Like if Right. If you Because even a best like right now, we're we're in a pretty direct connection to California direct like we're both dialed in California, you still have a two hundred millisecond draw or, yeah. or delay. Yeah. Right? I mean like it's just that's a best case scenario. That's right. But even more than that, I've got a um, a very unreliable internet connection here. It's just because of the um, the circumstances of where I'm located and the cables in the street, that sort of thing. So my mm -hmm. router drops out regularly. It can happen a couple of times a day sometimes. And if um, my internet connection dropping out means I can't turn on the lights, then that really sucks. Right, exactly. So yep. My general philosophy with home automation is that the home should never be dependent on external services. That's one of the rules. If you can't control everything locally while the house is offline, then you're in a bad place. Yep, yep. Mm. I totally agree. And uh, <laughs> I think even if you don't know, if you don't know where your data is going, right? I mean, like, I mean, how yeah. like... You, yeah, it's like your data is going off into the cloud. Like, that's okay, right. that's fine. But that also means someone might be able to read when you're home or not. And like there's security stuff with that too. And it's just... Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's, it's just um, a whole... It's leaking a whole lot of information that just doesn't need to be leaked. Exactly. And it's like, uh, I don't know. I, I <laughs> Obviously, I've been scared into thinking about security more than I ever had before. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure that a lot of my practices are not great. But um, yeah, I don't know. Like that kind of, that kind of stuff. Like... Okay, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be a little honest here, John. I don't really get a lot of this automation stuff. Like, I, I don't think much of it's needed. But yeah, you, I know you're doing it for fun too, right? Yes. Like, you you're just interested in this stuff. Yeah. So I, mean, I, I think there are certain justifications for it, and there are a certain. Well, what are, what are they? Uh, I'd love to hear them. Okay, so um, a lot of people use justifications that I don't think are valid, like power saving by having lights turn off automatically. I think mm -hmm. there are better ways to do that, but. Um, one of the really interesting ones is assisted living. So either the elderly or people who are confined to a wheelchair. Um, I've seen quite a few people who have benefited tremendously from some kind of remote control or automation. And okay. um, that could be lighting, um, something as simple as that. Uh, it could even go as far as actuators on doors so that someone who is confined to an electric wheelchair and only has control using say a joystick of right, the wheelchair right and like have a reach house that and stuff accommodates like that their needs that's right they can't right. yeah they can't necessarily reach a light switch which is high on the wall or um, you might come up to a door that opens towards you and how do you get through it if you're in a wheelchair so sure there are lots of things like that and um, so I think one okay of the so a system a system makes a lot of sense you're right and and in those cases too like those are usually like the monitoring is actually kind of a feature. Like, I mean, yes, there's still security concerns, but it's like you're you're hoping to watch out for someone, right, or something yes. like that. Yeah, a and geriatric sure or, or handicap or whatever, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah, that's right. So I think assisted okay, so living one. is you, you, one. You got one. <laughs> you got one. <laughs> I got one justification. So I'm planning ahead for my own dotage. And one day oh, I'm okay. going to be <laughs> uh, stumbling around, unable to hit light switches, and the system will accommodate me. Um, I, hope, no, I but, hope you've updated your system by that point. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that is a very clear, it, it is kind of niche, but I think it is a very clear application sure, yes. for this sort of thing. Uh, I think in a more general sense, there are uh, benefits to it that, um, 
it comes down to the old thing about, okay, so you've got a TV with a remote control. Do you get up off the couch to go and change the channels or do you sit there and press the button? And sure. No, I change it from my phone. Come on, man. (laughs) (laughs) So, well, sure, you could get up and change the channels on the TV by pressing the, you know, the TV itself. But we've become accustomed to the convenience of it. And there are little convenience things that you can do with home automation. Uh, things like grouping of actions together. Um, one that I oh, did so like real life scripting almost. Yeah, exactly. So one mm, uh, interesting. one script that I did fairly recently in my own house, and I'm going to do an episode about this in the future, is a leaving home script. Okay. And so what you do is hit a button on your phone or uh, a button on the wall just inside the front door, like it's on the light switch. And it turns off every light in the house, closes the blinds, closes the electric windows, um, sets the door locks to locked. Um, you can change the like the HVAC settings so that you're no longer heating a house that you're not in. So it can do a whole lot of different things like that just by pressing one button. And um, it avoids the problem of, oh, we're going out now, so walk around the house and you know make sure all the windows are closed <laughs> and... Lock the back right. door. <laughs> and I think I'm gonna have to give you a minus one on this one, though. Too. <laughs> I'm not sure that this. Is, that's not like. I mean, like you're saying, it's more for an insurance against whatever. But yeah, well, it's like central locking for your car as well. It's the same sort of thing, but it's central locking for your house. So you walk out the door, press a button, and you know the house is locked and every light is turned off. I I bought twenty thousand dollars worth of electronics to make sure I didn't have to do the thing that would have taken me three minutes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you're right. <clears throat> okay. I'll give you a quarter of a point. A little bit of a point. Okay. You got one (laughs) and a quarter points right now. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Okay. So um, I'll have one final attempt at it. This is a justification for the electric blinds that we have around the house. So we have a conservatory, which is a glass walled room with glass, like a a glass cathedral ceiling. And it, it, um, it curves around the end. So we have 12 blinds around the end of this room. And when they're open, basically the whole room is glass and you can see out in all directions. But opening and closing 12 blinds is a pain. And if uh, we would <laughs> just doing, leave I'm... them permanently open or permanently closed if they weren't motorized. So um, just being able to press a button as so... you walk past and they all open uh, <laughs> means that we open them when we wouldn't otherwise. Oh, I don't. I don't think I can give you more than I'm a quarter point on that one. I'm coming across so badly, I, aren't I? I know. This is like <laughs> I, I'm digging I mean, this I, hole, and I just keep digging. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, it's like okay, this is like high end stuff, and like I get it, right? Like this is, but I think you just proved my point. Like none of this stuff is necessary. Oh, no. Like for the assistive I, stuff, I agree. sure. Yeah, like that actually does make sense. Yes. But like a lot, and and I think that's a lot of the things that like people are like, oh, why don't we have more connected stuff? I think that there's not really needs for it, mm. but. There will be some stuff that pops out, right? People have said, oh, you don't need a garage door opener at some point as well, too. So Yes, that's right. Um, it's, I think probably more, more than right. anything, it'll, be, it'll become, a, it'll become a, 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 norm, a normalized thing, right? It's yes. like, oh, of course your blinds are, why would you turn the thing yourself? It's yeah. like, you just had that automatic thing. Yeah, it's, um, it's not necessary in the same way as a TV remote control is not necessary and a garage door remote control is not necessary. Right, right. It's it's a mm. uh, it's a further first wielding of a first world problem. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but I mean, but at the same time, I th- I think the thing that's interesting about that too, though, is that probably in the same way, right? Like the the people that had the first garage door openers were probably very high end clients, mm. and then eventually it just got it dropped in price and price and t- dropped and dropped and yes. dropped. So yeah, and eventually it became normal. Mm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Like, same thing with like Bluetooth and car, right? That's like almost ubiquitous these days. Yes. Only the highest end cars had that at the beginning. So yeah, yeah, that but, didn't take long at all. I mm. don't know. I, I understand don't, I don't your skepticism. <laughs> I, I live in a 500 square foot apartment, so I don't really. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not much. Was that mm. 10 square meters? Something like that? Yeah. Uh, no, no, it's no, 50 square meters. Bigger than that. Yeah. Yeah, 50 square meters. Yeah. It's I forgot. It's, I thought it was 50 or 10, 10 to the 10 to one. You know, whatever. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I'm glad you're working on the problems regardless. Well, quote, quote unquote problem. I'm glad you. I'm glad you're having fun. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. That's, yes. that's nice. Yeah, and yeah. I, I think that's um, probably one of the biggest adjustments that I need to make now with my change in my life circumstances. Is a lot of these things I've been doing this because I wanted to and for the fun of it, 
and um, now I need to justify doing things because I need the income. Right, um, money. Money's yeah, a thing. Yeah. 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 Welcome. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The mm. fact that you you did it the, the other way so long is is actually the the most impressive thing. So I mean, it's yeah. unfortunate how it all worked out. I I, I do feel for you on that stuff. Mm. That, that sucks. Yeah, thanks. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that you are entering a period of rapid growth and uh, interesting problems to mm. solve, and I'm sure you're going to be fine. Yes, <laughs> there'll be many new opportunities. That's mm. right. So uh, if people have an opportunity, how do they get in touch with you? They can email john at oxer which is o-x-e-r dot com dot au it's probably the best way okay um i am way behind on email only 30 or forty thousand unread but still give it a try <laughs> yeah um, right yeah twitter I'm, too right yeah i'm on, twitter, on twitter at john oxer yeah and um those are probably the best ways yeah Usually, usually Twitter is the one where it's like you could, if you really need to, you can keep pinging that person. Yeah, Eventually that's right. Gonna, yeah. Here, here's the real question: Do you do you get Twitter notifications on your phone? I do. Yes. Yeah. Then yeah. eventually you're gonna I'll get notice. a hold of them. If you know, some, like, if you yeah. ping me on Twitter. Yeah. 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 People ping me on Twitter. I'm gonna see it eventually. Yeah. You know. And if you want to see some of the totally unnecessary projects that are totally frivolous, <laughs> check out superhouse.tv. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. Which also has an associated uh, YouTube channel. Yes, that's right. So yeah. I put everything up on YouTube and then just embed it in the um, in the Superhouse site. So one of the things I try to do with that is not just make videos, but also make um, associated documentation and guides. Right. So yep. it's a project page that has the video embedded in it, and then it will also have things like links to the source code and everything else that's referenced in the video. Yep, that's great. That's great. Cool, man. Well, I'm going to definitely check. I want to check out this 433 megahertz radio thing. I, it's got me thinking about some things about my apartment, too, that I might, okay. I might, yeah, who knows? Maybe I'll have some <laughs> connectedness around here. Ooh, yes, you might go to the dark side. Yeah. The one I was thinking about is like, okay, here, here's a first world problem for you. Mm -hmm. You go out running, right? Yes. And you don't want to carry a key in case you lose it, right? <laughs> so, okay. You ring up to the house, you ring up to the apartment. It has some kind of buzz, having like an auto answer and then like somehow buzzing the person in, right? Like, so like having like, I'm like actuator sitting there pressing the buttons and listening to my voice or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. So that that's my idea for our home automation thing. Okay. So we'll see. Yeah. Could be an interesting project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool, man. Well, uh, we'll see you online and we'll talk to you soon, I'm sure. Absolutely. Thanks for being Thanks. on the show. Thanks, Chris. All right. All right.